Good morning and welcome to Paul T's World. And in this episode, we're going to have a look at the shrubs and flowers that are in flower in March. My garden is in the northwest of England, just on the coast. It's zone 9A, believe it or not. It's zone 9A and it's on sandstone, so the soil is very sandy. Of course, I put a lot of compost on, which allows it to hold the moisture and the nutrients a little better, because obviously with sand, it can go straight through, uh, particularly in the winter. Uh, we've had a, quite a mild winter, at least on the west coast. I know that the southeast of England, Scotland, the Midlands have had some quite cold temperatures uh, this last month or two, but we've got down to minus two, uh, centigrade for a couple of nights on two occasions. Uh, at the moment it's about 10 degrees centigrade. This weekend is the vernal equinox. It's officially spring. Of course the birds and the flowers and the shrubs they already know it's spring. In fact just this morning I was looking at the female blackbird who's busy making a nest. It's quite funny really because the female blackbird is there flying backwards and forwards getting material for the nest and the male blackbird is standing on the pole there eating sunflower hearts. <laughs> I suppose things <laughs> You've got to laugh, haven't you, hey? Hey guys, it's the way it is. This is the bed that's at the top of the front garden and we've got two dwarf rhododendrons. And this one here, I, I say dwarf, look how large they are now. The bees love these rhododendrons. And it gives them some food early on in the season because there are plenty of bumblebees around at the moment. But every year this particular rhododendron is the first to come out in my garden. Also in the front garden is the Forsythia and the flowering current. Now this Forsythia isn't doing as well as it used to do a number of years ago and I'm not quite sure why, but it is in flower. It's used a lot in Britain as a hedging plant. And just in front of it is one of my flowering currants. And next to them is the viburnum tinus which is uh, still in flower and this flowers through the winter. The red robin although not in flower has its lovely red leaves. The red robin produces its red leaves on new growth. So as soon as all these leaves have turned green, then I'll prune it back again, and then we'll have another flush of red leaves later on in the season. Next to the red robin, we have the contorted hazel, not flowers, but it's got its little catkins. Always nice when something's either flowering or grow, putting on new growth early in the spring. And here we have the hellebores in this woodlandy area underneath the rhododendrons. They've been in flower for a couple of months now. When they first come into flower, they have some large old leaves. And so it's a good idea with hellebores, just take away, take off all the large leaves so you can see the flowers and the new little leaves coming through. Let's just move through and see some of the other hellebores. Just passing under the Magnolia stellata.
and here amongst the hellebores is a mophead hydrangea that I've pruned but I'm going to actually take out and put somewhere else in the next week. And here's a view of the dwarf rhododendron from above. Along with the azaleas and the paniculata hydrangea. Gorgeous. White is absolutely gorgeous. And here's the second viburnum tinus that I've got in the front garden, just behind the wall. And we've got the candy toft that is thinking about flowering in the next week. If I just pan round to this little azalea bed, we can see some of the azaleas are thinking about flowering in the next few weeks. The aubretia, which will be in full flower in a few weeks, just has its first few flowers. These are the wind breaks I've got. Between the two houses, I've got some nice big thick viburnum to slow down the wind that rushes between two buildings. And this one, the, uh, the one towards the front of the house, just look at this cl uh, clematis, which is nice and thick. Oh, this looks gorgeous uh, in early summer. And the clematis is in flower. It's got all its uh, new buds starting. Oh, it's gorgeous when you've got clematises growing right up through shrubs and trees. Another flowering current, just a little bit earlier than this one. This is the one that had a little bit of fire blight last year and I think I need to prune it a little bit. We've got some crossing stems here, so I need to thin this out. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave it alone till after it's flowered and then prune it back once it's flowered, which of course is what you would do with most flowering shrubs. Prune them back, sort them out, after they've flowered. Let's move over now to the camellia, the star of the show in January, February and March. This is the most popular one in Britain, the pink one. I've got a red one that's at the front of the house, um, but this one actually performs much better. Again, the thing to do once it's flowered is then cut it back if you have to. Often camellias don't need cutting back. In fact, this one does because it sends off all sorts of shoots through the summer, which I cut back as early as I can to ensure I get flowers the following spring. Now, as you can see with this particular flower, it's been hit by the frost and camellias can be susceptible to that. They say don't plant camellias facing east. What I do in the spring every year is
I take out as much of the compost here as I can. It'll be about three or four inches of the compost. And then I replenish it with fresh ericaceous compost. Camellias like acidic soil. So they're ideal for pots or like this in a bed in the patio. Now in my garden, of course, I can grow acidic plants quite easily because I'm on a slightly acidic sandy soil. But if you fancy a camellia or indeed azalea and you don't have acidic soil, put them in a pot and then you can give them the exact and precise soil that they want. Lots of buds still to come out. Gorgeous. And now let's move over to the bottom of the back garden. Underneath the apple tree, we've got the daffodils. Also in the back garden, in this area here, I've got some more hellebores and these are really nice. I'm making this a woodland looking patch as well because I've got the foxgloves planted behind. Here's all the foxgloves. Oh, and a few other woodland plants such as the lords and ladies at the back there. And there are some uh, Solomon's seal. So what I've done with this bed is I've put some leaf mold on and compost and also some wood chippings that I've bought. So as you can see, I've taken away the large leaves so that you can see the lovely flowers. Behind the magnolia tree here, we've got the snowdrops. Now the snowdrops are over, they're completely over now. Uh, but of course, I videoed them for you when they're in their prime. So let's have a look at how the snowdrops were over the last couple of months. And here we have the snowdrops that are along the along the beach hedge. Now's a good time to move snowdrops. It's called in the green. So the flowers are over. Great time to dig them up, split the clumps and let them naturalize somewhere else. Great little plant. And I'm also going to show you some snowdrops that were in a public garden that I photographed about six weeks ago. Thank you for joining me today in my garden in the northwest of England in mid-March. See you next time. Bye.